we're talking about it. It's because we're talking about it. The T. Gerard Williams Show. Yeah. Hey, hey, my friends. This is T. Gerard Williams, your host and executive producer of the T. Gerard Williams Show. And tonight, I have a guest on that we are going to tread some water that we haven't done in quite a while. And he is calling into our show tonight from San Antonio, Texas. Mr. Sheffield, his name is Jonathan Sheffield. Mr. Sheffield, are you on the line, sir? Yes, I am. It is good to have you here tonight, and I am certainly glad that you are calling in to to talk to us tonight. And uh, I've put out a couple of announcements on Facebook and a few other of our social media to announce uh, that you are going to be here tonight. And prayerfully, we will get everything answered tonight and excite our listeners. Uh, So let me just do this. Um, Can you just tell us, first of all, who you are and a little something about you, and we'll go from there. Okay, well, thank you for having me on the show. My name is Jonathan Sheffield. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and now I live in San Antonio, Texas with my wife and my three kids. And over the last uh, couple of years, I have created a new uh, genre in Christian apologetics, uh, with the main subject being the defense of the New Testament text. Okay, now, Christian apologetics. A lot of people have heard the term, really aren't sure about it, but I, I, you kind of led into what it is, but can you kind of give us a, a firm definition of it so that the, the listeners who have never heard it before can um, identify with it and those who already know what it is will solidify in their mind that they were right? <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. In a, an apology is a defense. Um, in, in, and it's common in scripture, especially Peter, you know, give a reason for the defense or the belief that is within us. So as a Christian apologetic, I am giving a defense for Christianity, and particularly the defense of the sacred scriptures themselves. So uh, the gospel authors, uh, the readings that are contained within the Bible. So I'm offering a defense for the reliability. And as an apologist, that's what I'm doing. Okay. Now, I understand that, that apologetics uses the, uh, a certain format um, to validate the, the scriptures, um, using historical uh, information, reasoned information, and evidential information just to kind of uh, defend the, the objections, or actually to defend against the objections. So is that where you're, you're, you're headed in, in your apologetics? Uh, Yes, sir. So, you know, we start off with obviously uh, a biblical defense, you know, where we get it from, and then we go and uh, provide witness testimony uh, uh, from the historical side as well. So it's uh, it's kind of a a little bit of both. Okay. Sounds good, actually. So now, I, I realize that, and one of the reasons why I really wanted you to be on the call tonight was because you said that you had started a new genre and this is uh, 2D, 3D animation, and you sent me a copy of it, and I have to tell you and I have to tell my listeners that I was absolutely floored by it. Um, I do a little videography and a little video animation, but nothing compared to what you, what you put together in, in the way that it was done and in the, the process of, of making something complicated or perceived to be complicated to be so simple. And and I applaud your efforts on, on how you put the animation together. I'm really really impressed. Oh well, thank you. And 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 my main purpose in putting together uh, these videos is to help communicate to a modern audience in a way that will help them better understand the major issues that we're trying to defend, and allow them to grasp the material in in, in a way that will be much more easily to digest. Uh, when I was uh, looking at starting this ministry, what I noticed out there, especially on YouTube and other forums, 
they're either you know 50 page articles there's someone sitting in front of their uh, uh, desk office with books in the background and I'm like well how does that really convey the information over to me uh, even though we are adults cartoons are very receptive and they really help communicate a lot of messages uh, in a way that uh, kind of grabs our attention so I thought why not do something very similar in conveying you know these really important uh, concepts in a way that someone can understand them much more easily well I think you nailed that down pretty good because it I, I was watching it and and it, it drew me in instantly. And um, like I said, it, we are visual creatures, and that was really helpful. And then it, it wasn't like a long video. I mean, it wasn't like something that was dry, dry and, and dull and boring. It was actually interesting, and, and it drew me in to, to want to know more and to, to see the next video. So like I said, that was impressive. So now let oh, me ask you this, and let me draw you into this now. The video that I looked at, was one where you were having a debate with um, Dr. Uh, what's his name? Uh, El Bart er Ehrman. Bart Ehrman. Okay, right, great. Um, and after I looked at the first video, I went and looked at a video that that Dr. Ehrman had already done. And in that video, he said something that I really thought was odd. He said that I used to be a Christian. He said he said when I was a Christian. He, he thought this way, and now he's actually um, moving into a different direction. And I wonder, I'm saying, well, if you're not a Christian, what else could you be? So, uh, but he seemed to be the one that you were uh, dealing with in this particular video that I, that you showed me. Can you explain how you got involved with him and how that happened, how that came about? Oh, of course. Now, as part of the beginning of my ministry, obviously I wanted to actually – uh, defend a major principle, which is the reliability of the New Testament. So we're talking about the 27 books of the New Testament from the Gospels all the way to Revelation. Now, right. within the, the books of the Bible are also the readings that have come down to us in the books, which I also defend. So uh, when I started up the animations, you know, I wanted to focus my attention on major scholars such as Bart Ehrman, who is not a Bible-believing Christian, um, but he's agnostic. So he really doesn't know what to believe, but he has moved away from uh, the Christian faith, once being a Christian. Right. Um, and now the reason why I targeted Dr. Ehrman is because he has popularized two major conspiracy theories, as I call it, that attack the reliability of the New Testament. First, uh, which is uh, which he goes over in Forged and misquoting uh, Jesus, is that the gospel authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that we know of were not actually written by the disciples of Jesus. In actuality, his his version of the story is. These stories were carried down through an oral tradition, and about 50 years after the life of Jesus, uh, well-educated Greek scribes came along and published what we commonly refer to as the Gospels. Um, and, and secondly, his second major attack on the reliability of the New Testament is after these Gospels have been published, and the remaining books of the New Testament, that there was an evolution of sorts. So the New Testament text that we know of today, whether we read the King James Bible or some other version of the Bible, is not the same readings that was originally published when the gospel came into the churches. So readings such as the last 12 verses of Mark, um, the woman in adultery, uh, Jesus' cry out to forgive the Jews when he's up at the cross, readings like that were added into the text after its initial publication for various reasons. Okay. I do understand what you're saying. Now, in, in all fairness to Dr. 
Berman, who is not here, Dr. Bach Berman, who is not on the call with us tonight. Um, we're not going to bash him, but we're going to deal with his his um, his standpoint, his philosophy, and certainly I think that's only fair. So I just want to say that we're not you know going out on a vendetta against him, but we're using his his train of thought as a, as a premise for what we're going to be talking about tonight. So yeah, and uh, just and, and just to give you that. a little more back, just to give you a little more background, after creating uh, several uh, video productions. I wanted to reach out to Dr. Aaron personally to get his attention because, you know, I've already done some animations targeting his theories, which attack the credibility of the New Testament. So I actually signed up on his personal blog uh, at the Bart Ehrman blog, uh, com and signed up for a membership. And I knew the best way to really get his attention is to post an open challenge, uh, posting my videos up on the members forum. And if you think about it, it's, it's sort of on the site. It's like the schoolyard where everyone comes to hang out. And I figured, you know, if I call out the bully in front of all his fans and his friends, he's going to need to come out and address me. So uh, that was sort of my um, strategy going in. And uh, after posting... Uh, the challenge and speaking with several of his uh, uh, fan base, Dr. Ehrman actually sent me a personal email um, asking me to actually come over and move my open challenge over to his public blog where he can address it there. And from that time, we had a, you know, a back and forth discussion uh, attacking, you know, the major views that I see that's wrong with his theories. Wow, that's amazing, and and very well played, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, I mean, I mean, he's a very popular author, but if you go out to his fan base and his fan base is like, hey, you know, someone's out there calling names at you, uh, what are you going to do? So it caught his attention. Um, obviously, he was very pleasant on their blog. I was very respectful to him. But, you know, I was going to challenge his assertions. And what this latest video publication is, is a recreation of our de facto debate that we had on his blog from the period of July 30th, 2017 through October 29th, 2017. And the videos are great. And uh, we will definitely, uh, to, to the listeners who are out there listening right now, we will definitely post the links to the videos, to as I say, we're going to post a link to uh, his YouTube channel and his Facebook uh, page. If that's um, we're going to, if we, if once we get that lined up, but we're definitely going to go into YouTube and make those videos. You need to see that. You need to see that for yourself, uh, because you know a lot of times people will say a lot of things about the New Testament, and they say a lot of things about the Bible. Period. But the the chief argument is that it's um, it, it contradicts itself, and it doesn't. It, it never has. For example, um, I know that when they say that Judas hung himself, one of the, the, the gospels says that he, they saw him hanging. Another gospel says that they saw him on the ground, guts, you know, open. And so if you think about it, all that signifies is that, yes, he was hanging, and on a branch, the branch broke, he fell, so when I saw him, he was hanging. When you came by and saw him, he was on the ground. Does that make that a different story? Is this a different point in time? So I know that yeah, Dr. Ehrman was saying something similar to that, that it was a lot of controversy about the agreement about what each writer was saying. But I don't think that his, his point is valid, as you pointed out in, in the video. Oh, no, I agree. And you know, and I think for people to understand what we're talking about is four independent witnesses providing their testimony on what happened in the first century. Um, and, you know, we, we do have it from four different uh, accounts. And, and if you think about it from a legal aspect, how important is that? Because, you know, in any normal trial or court of law, you're going to bring witnesses independent witnesses to give an account. Now, if all four Gospels gave the same perspective, 
gave the same testimony, the first thing people would start to think is collusion. Did these guys get together to make this up? But because there's an independence on each of these books of the Bible, it's actually a further witness and testimony to the credibility of the, test, uh, of the witnesses, which we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. Now, interestingly that you mentioned, first of all, that Dr. Ehrman was a, a credentialed guy. You know, he's a, he has a, the, the PhD. He has all the credentials. Now, a lot of times when people go up against people like that, and, and even in the way that you did it to the video, uh, they have some type of equal balance on their end to say, yeah, you got a doctor degree, so do I. But I realize that, that you don't. So, so in your case, what gives you the unction to challenge these uh, experts uh, in, in their field? Because you, you did, you're actually in their backyard dealing with what they have with the school to learn and to deal with. So my question basically is, who are you? Okay, no, it's a very fair question. And I, I kind of liken myself to the kid, the little boy in the crowd, shouting out that the emperor has no clothes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. You, you, you know, and, you, you know, and it's actually interesting because what I have done in the introduction to the video is really a play on that whole concept. Because, I mean, if you think back of the story, it's a little kid. He doesn't know who the king is. All he sees, he, he goes out there, he sees what's going on, and he just shouts out, the emperor has no clothes, you know, he he wasn't smart enough to really think that this is the emperor I should be saying this, but he, he he shouted out what he perceived. And, you know, in the beginning of the video where I do a play on the Matrix scene, the whole point is Dr. Ehrman has been promoting these postmodern narratives or his narrative on how we got the text of the New Testament. Um, and that's and in that scene, it kind of plays into the role of waking him up and saying, well, I really need you to look at what's happening here because what you're saying does not match reality. Right. Um, and, and if you think about it, what I'm asking is just, is just simple questions. Now, um, what I'm saying is no different than John William Bergen, who was a English Anglican divine who lived, you know, right around in the late 1800s, when these theories started coming out, attacking the credibility of the New Testament, him, you know, just like myself, were asking these same questions. Who did it? Who was behind this process? Where did this come from? And these are the same questions that we're asking Dr. Ehrman today in my videos. It's like, okay, well, if well-educated Greeks were responsible for the creation of the Bible, who were they? I mean, where did they come from? What, what were their names? I mean, because when you hear, well, unknown people, you, you start thinking of Never Never Land or Once Upon a Time. I have no dates, times, or locations. And even if these unknown people did create these texts, how did they get them into all the churches? Because uh, the churches in the West, the churches in Egypt, the Coptic, the Alexandrian church, um, the Aramaic churches, the Greek churches, they all have four Gospels. And the interesting part is, even though the gospel text did not have their names or assigned by the disciples. All these independent witnesses in the Latin West, the Greek East, the Aramaic churches, the Coptic churches, they all come up with the names of the same four gospels. So how do you get all these churches to agree when they were fighting amongst themselves and then get them to name the same authors unless it does go back to the apostles, as we have ancient testimony from Tertullian, who was a member of the North African Church in the 2nd century, and Irenaeus, who was a bishop of Lyons 
uh, from Asia Minor, uh, preaching from Gaul, on the testimony, responding to critics of his day that said the Bible was also corrupted. Mm. Interesting. Now, um, now, Dr. Urban did not present any factual validation or any kind of authority that 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 deemed his uh, position to be valid. Well, yeah, and, and if you think about it, all I'm asking is simple questions. If, as you say, they were edu- they were written by well-educated Greeks, it, it's it's kind of interesting. Why would well-educated Greeks? And if you th- think about this for a second, if you went to Harvard or you went to Cambridge, you would expect uh, a level of education to reflect that. Now, it's interesting that the Greek churches use Koine Greek, which is the common Greek or the uh, the basic, you know, conversational Greek of the day. So why would well-educated Greeks write in Koine in, with smatterings of Aramaic instead of Attic or Alexandrian Greek? Because if you think of the high-class Greek, you think of the schools of Athens, of Aristotle, of Plato, of Socrates, you know, the the golden uh, language of Greek, not basic Greek. Because his basic presumption is, well, you know, the disciples of Jesus were uh, basically poor Aramaic-speaking peasants who couldn't read or write. And, you know, the the Bible is written in Koine. So when he goes through his narrative that the Bible was written by uh, well-educated Greeks, well... They wouldn't have written in uh, basic English <laughs> if that was the case. Exactly right. That That's a, an amazing point. And, and so how does he address that? Well, he doesn't. In, uh, during our uh, de facto debate on this question, uh, he was presented with the historical reality because part of bringing him out of, his, uh, out of the matrix was to help get him to deal with reality. We're talking about four books that were published in the ancient world, not in make-believe, and they were published to the historical churches. And there's, on his side, no denying that the churches of Antioch, Alexandria, the North African churches, the Church of Rome, uh, Constantinople, all these historical churches did exist, and most of them still exist to this day. They all come up with these same four Gospels. They all name basically the same authors for documents that didn't have their name on it. So how does Dr. Ehrman account for that historical reality unless it does go back to the apostles? Because how are four unknown scribes convincing all these churches that these are the official texts and all the other gospels, so-called gospels, that were available and published out there never made it into the churches. Hmm. That's a very interesting subject. You know, and, and the thing is, we really don't have the time tonight to, to cover all the ground that I would love to, to deal with this tonight, but, but let me ask you this. If if we were able to to reconnect and and maybe spend a little bit more time, would that be uh, agreeable to you? Oh, definitely. Okay, good. I, I think we'll try to set that up because I, I I really think that this is a powerful powerful subject, and uh, most of the time people shy away from talking religion, but but there has to be a defense when the challenge is presented that what we believe, what we uh, accept as as our faith, and we, and we believe it by faith, that someone has to, to, to answer that challenge. And, I, and I'm glad that you're doing it in a way that is, you know, easy for people to, to relate to. Wow. And we, we will definitely do this again. Um, let me do this. One thing that I wanted to do, Today, you were on our call. What was the, the, the impetus of what you really wanted to share today? We talked about what you did, what you do, 
how you put it together and who you were um, actually uh, confronting with um, particularly, but what's the impetus behind what you're doing? Well, uh, most of what I'm doing is really to get the message out that there's there's these major theories that are being promoted not only by uh, scholars like Dr. Ehrman who don't believe the Bible, but many evangelical Christians who do profess believing in the Bible and the preservation of Scripture are also promoting these scriptures, uh, these theories that attack uh, the scriptures of the Bible to say these passages weren't in there. So what my main focus is really get the message out there, how we can defend and guard against uh, protecting the scriptures against this type of scholarship, which has only come to light within the last 200 years. So um, it's not to make money or get millions of subscribers, what I'm doing is purely to help educate and communicate uh, this defense to others so they can guard against such attacks. Well, listen, I love what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. And I believe that you will be blessed beyond anything that this world can offer you. And having said that, my friend, uh, this is T. Gerard Williams, your host and your executive producer of the T. Gerard Williams Show. And as always, my friends, I'll see you when I see you. Bye-bye now. The T. Gerard Williams Show. talking about.